Hello, this is Dr. Paul Cottrell, and we're going to be going over Chapter 2 of Para Aduma, which is the red heifer. Chapter 2. Extra stringencies were employed with regard to the purity observed in preparation for offering the red heifer, and great... A extremes were taken to keep a distance from the ritual ritual impurity associated with the human corpse in all the activities associating with its offering. The rationale is that since it is acceptable for a person who immersed that day to bring it, our sages were concerned that people would treat this offering with disdain. For this reason, when the priest who burns it is isolated, he is isolated to a prepared chamber in the temple courtyard. It was called the House of Stone because all the utensils in it were stone utensils that do not contact impurity. We would use the stone, or he would use the stone utensils throughout the seven days that he is isolated. His priestly brethren would not touch him in order to increase his purity. For seven days before the burning of the red heifer, the priest who would burn it is isolated from his home, just like the high priest is isolated from the sake of the service of Yom Kippur. This was received as part of the oral tradition for Moses. Similarly, he is isolated from his wife, lest it be discovered that she was a Nida and he be impure for seven days. The chamber in which this priest would abide for all these seven days was in the northeast portion of the temple courtyard. It was positioned there to to remind the priest that the red heifer is like a, a sin offering that is slaughtered in the northern portion of the temple courtyard, even though the red heifer is slaughtered outside the temple. On every one of the, on every one of the seven days of his isolation, water with the ashes of the red heifer should be sprinkled upon him, lest he unknowingly had contracted impurity due to con due to contact with a corpse, with the exception of the fourth day of his isolation. This day does not require sprinkling. The rationale is, is that it is impossible for it to be the third day of his impurity or the seventh day of his impurity for the sprinkling of ashes on the seventh day is not considered as the sprinkling of the seventh day unless the ashes were sprinkled on the third day before it. According to law, there is no need to sprinkle the ashes upon him on any days other than the third and the seventh day of isolation. The sprinkling day after day is an extra stringency enacted with regard to the red heifer. Now, it's important to mention here that they're talking about when the red heifer ashes were already established. Um, since we are re since this since there's no ashes left, uh, th then the red heifer sacrifice and the burning there's an added complication, which would be very similar to the very first time that Moses actually uh, did the red heifer burning. So keep that in mind, that there's nothing to sprinkle the, the uh, cones. Now, because of that, that means that for this red heifer, in our day, the person that's actually going to be slaughtering, it has to be 100% pure in terms of contacting, you know, in, in contact any with any dead dead corpses. Now, I'm not sure if that includes just humans or other species. I think it's other species too. He 
would be isolated on Wednesday so that the fourth day of his isolation would fall on the Sabbath for the sprinkling of the ashes of the red heifer does not supersede the Sabbath prohibitions. And the fourth day does not require the sprinkling of the ashes. On all the days of his isolation, when the ashes of the red heifer are sprinkled upon him, the ashes of all the red heifers that were burnt previously were sprinkled on him. If, however, there were only ashes from the one red heifer, those ashes are used for all six days. When the ashes of the red heifer are sprinkled upon him during the days of his isolation, the sprinkling should be performed by a man who never contracted the ritual impurity stemming from a human corpse. So even, even the sprinkling had to be done by a person that was never in contact. The rationale is, is that a person sprinkling the ashes must be pure. If one would say, let's sow and sow a person who had contracted impurity, but then had the ashes of the red heifer sprinkled upon him, sprinkled ashes on the priest who will burn the red heifer, that suggests that, that suggestion is not followed. The rationale is, is that it is possible that a person who sprinkled the ashes upon so-and-so was not pure from the impurity associated with the corpse. Similarly, the utensils that are used to be filled and consecrated to sprinkle on the priest who burns the red heifer were all stone utensils that are not susceptible to ritual impurity. All of these practices are extra stringencies enacted with regard to the red heifer. How is it possible to find a person who has never contracted the impurity associated with the human corpse? There were courtyards in Jerusalem built on slabs of stone and a place under them as hollow lest there be a grave in the in the depths of the earth. So my understanding is this is kind of like a basement kind of situation. Pregnant women were brought there. They would give birth there and raise their sons there when they wanted to sprinkle ashes on the priests who would burn the red heifer. They would bring oxen because they have ample bellies and place doors on their backs and have the children sit on the board so that there would be an Oh, oh, hell. Intervening. O-H-E-L. Oh, hell. Oh, hell. Intervening between them and the earth, lest they contract impurity from a grave in the depths of the earth. They would have cups of stone in their hands and would go to the Shiloh spring when they reached the Shilolach, the children would descend and give the the children would descend and fill the cups. We do not suspect that they will contract impurity from a grave in the depths of the earth at the spring because it is not ordinary practice to bury the dead in streams. They would ascend and sit on the doors and proceed upward until they reach the temple mount when they reach the temple mount they would descend and proceed on their feet because the entire area of the temple and its court yards were built over a hollow cavity lest there be a grave in the depths of the earth they would proceed to the entrance to the temple courtyard at the entrance to the temple courtyard there was a pitcher of ashes they would take the ashes and place them on the water in the cups and sprinkle them on the priest who burns the, the heifer. The children who would fill the water, consecrate it with the ashes and sprinkle it on 
the priest who burns the heifer must immerse in a mikvah, even though they are pure, with regard to the impurity associated with a human corpse, it is possible that they contracted other forms of impurity. When a child immer immersed himself in a mikvah in order to fill pitchers with water and sprinkle it, another child should not fill those containers with water, even though he immersed himself. When a child immersed himself to sprinkle the water of the ashes on one priest, he would not sprinkle the water on another priest until he immerses again for the sake of purifying that priest. Similarly, when utensils or people are purified for the sake of offering one red heifer, they would not become involved in the offering of another red heifer until they immerse themselves for its sake. All of these are extra stringencies required for the offering of the red heifer. That's chapter two, Apira Aduma. So please subscribe to my channels. I have three channels on YouTube, Bright Jam, Bit Shoot, and Rumble. Make sure that you get you click the notification, you're subscribing to all those channels. Also follow me on X and on Gitter. The links are in the description of this video. In addition, please help support my work by donating on my website. It's the-studio-reykjavik.com. Links in the description of this video. You can donate through Stripe, PayPal, or buy me a coffee. You can also support my work by being a paid member on my Patreon. Uh, I have different tiers that have different access to some of my lectures on pulmonology. So please uh, subscribe there. It will help to support my work. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.